Hello everyone. Welcome, bienvenue, atlan beacon to everyone. Um, I know we're in many different time zones, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as it applies to you. Welcome to our latest Everyday Orientalism panel on Afro-Eurasian antiquities beyond the Euro-American gaze, which is a sequel of sorts, um, or a, a reboot of perhaps of a panel that we, we ran in the autumn, which I, I know we all got a lot out of uh, that conversation. So I'm really delighted to be here with you today on behalf of myself, Rachel Mares, Catherine Bluan and Osama Ali Gad. We are the, the co-conveners of Everyday Orientalism and to welcome our, our wonderful panel of speakers. A couple of basic housekeeping things. Um, do please keep yourself muted if you're not speaking. Um, and while you're welcome to use the chat once the discussion begins. It can be a bit distracting for speakers if people are talking in the chat box while they're talking. So, so please refrain from that. Um, I will introduce each of our speakers. They will then uh, talk for five minutes or so presenting some questions and problems of relevance to the topic. And then we'll open the floor to general discussion. If you would like to ask a question or join the discussion, you can use the, the raise hand function on Zoom, or you can type in the, the chat box if you would like to either be called on to speak or if you would like me to relay your question for you. So without further ado, let me introduce our wonderful panel of speakers. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Juliana Bastos Marquez, who is Assistant Professor of Ancient History at the uh, Federal University of the State of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. She published uh, a monograph in uh, Portuguese in 2012 on tradition and um, renewal of, ident of Roman identity in Titus Livius and Tacitus, and has been publishing in the fields of Roman historiography, theory of history, and digital public history. Her current research topic deals with the reception of the ancient world in Brazilian contemporary politics and society. And she has been a Fulbright Fellow at Florida State University and a Newton Fellow at Newcastle University, two places with very different climates. Her next book, which is co-edited with Federico Santangelo, is entitled Authority in History, Ancient Models, Modern Questions, and is going to be published by Bloomsbury Press in early 2022. I said that I would introduce all of our speakers. Not that early anymore, right? Sorry. <laughs> I said that I would introduce all of our um, speakers first, but I think now that I'm, I'm going through the bios, it might actually be best if I, if I gave the bio immediately before the person speaks so that it's fresh in everybody's mind. Does that, does that seem reasonable? Can I get nods or shakes of head? Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to hand over to, to Juliana to, to give us her thoughts on the topic. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Um, so since I talked too much last time, <laughs> for anybody who uh, followed the other panel or, or uh, watched the recording later, I was thinking, this time I was thinking about um, asking a couple of questions, things that have been uh, in my mind and while talking to some other people about the conditions of um, research and particularly the conditions of teaching about the ancient world. And in this sense, I'm particularly thinking about undergraduate teaching, not necessarily graduate studies or higher uh, uh, research uh, levels of things because because the undergrads are the ones who are going to teach. Children and teenagers are going to replicate what we, um, or replicate or not, what we give them in the course. And we, we don't keep track of them as much as we keep track of the graduate students and they're very important too. So, and I teach undergraduates, first year actually undergraduates. So I keep thinking, what is the meaning of what I do with them? And then I was talking to some friends in the UK and the US, and that made me think um, about how much freedom we have. Um, essentially, what I wanted to ask, which I know this is really broad, but I know everybody has a saying uh, in, the, in their own fields, in their own um, particular situations in their own country and everything about 
uh, well, the question is, do, and I, and I, had, I had asked this question about myself, do, I, do you do what you do because you want to change things or do you do what you do because you want to keep things as they are? And I believe most, or not everyone in this panel or uh, people who are watching, may, they may choose the first thing, the first option. I do what I do because I want to change things, hopefully, I think. But uh, sometimes it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. So uh, what would be uh, the institutional problems that you have to deal with? If you, if you have any problems with trying to engage the students into changing any reality, changing approaches, changing whatever you, you or they feel like they need to change, do they expect you to do that? Or do they expect you not to do that? And they kind of, well, what's going on here? And do you have any problems, institutional problems, or do you have any other problems with that sort of cultural or uh, unspoken uh, assumptions that you uh, shouldn't talk about contemporary, let's say contemporary politics when you talk about the ancient world. So uh, how much do we in our realities are able to change perspectives? And then I'm no, just to finish this, I'm thinking about the undergrads, of course, this goes on uh, with lots of things of research, of course, and I know some people here are gonna talk about this in terms of research. But I was thinking about uh, teaching itself what we do as the concept, the real consequences of what we do for as many people as possible in terms of teaching. And this is what I've been thinking about, about myself, about my situation here in Brazil. And that I'm really interested about your situations over there, everybody, of course, not just the panelists, everybody who wants to talk about this too. And this is my participation for the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliana. Uh, a reminder uh, to folks, please save up your questions and thoughts uh, and reflections until the end of um, each of our speakers presenting, and then we'll be able to come back to some of the points that Juliana has made. So Hopefully you don't forget that. No, Hopefully you don't forget. Worry. Right. I won't, I won't because forget. I was the first one. <laughs> and you know, Juliana, if you show us your cat again, then you definitely get more speaking time. Yeah, well, she's thinking right now, later in the okay. discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Amy Daniels, who is a former German and English teacher who decided to join the ranks of professional classicists in 2014. Though no longer a fledgling academic, Amy feels as though she's constantly running into things she doesn't know or needs to learn more about. Sounds familiar? And that's what excites her about engaging with Greco-Roman antiquity. In her job as a lecturer at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, she teaches Latin to beginners and intermediate students and is also involved in facilitating modules on ancient Pompeii, mythology, epic, Greek drama and more. Her PhD project concerns Augustine of Hippo's martyr sermons and anti-Donatist polemic through the lens of trauma studies. Welcome, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Katrin, Osama, everyone at Arie Everyday Orientalism for the opportunity to share my thoughts um, once more on this platform. Um, I was thinking about our previous discussion, and as I remember, there was much focus on identity politics and what those of us who stand outside the European and American ways of seeing um, and doing um, how we experience our engagement with pre-modern history and our institutions. Now, that type of conversation, I believe, is so necessary, and I'm so glad that we are having more conversations in light of that. And I'm glad to report that after the previous panel, some in my circles who needed to hear it really did hear it, and in fact, listen. They listened. Um, and I found myself even more drawn than usual to related discussions. Um, for example, everyday orientalism's discussion on Eurocentrism and gatekeeping and publishing and citational politics. And all of this has got me thinking what we are and can do to make a real impact um, and to dismantle the white Euro-American cis male intellectual hegemony 
um, within our disciplines. So that's sort of where I'm coming from at the moment. Um, and just by way of a caveat, especially for those in attendance who weren't at the panel discussion last year and may not know, though I'm a classicist working in higher ed, my focus is primarily on teaching and social outreach. So I am by no means <laughs> a great researcher participating in high academic debate. My reading and thinking goes straight into teaching on a wide array of topics, and I do this because transformative teaching really is the most direct way that classics can have an impact on the lives of diverse people. In my case, people who bring Southern African gazes to the material being taught, people who live and move in South African spaces and can bring what they learn in the classics lecture theater or after school classroom to bear on their context. So I think that kind of dovetails with what Juliana was talking about earlier. So as such, my primary focus must be on what and how I teach. What dictates our curricula? Do we follow ages old canon blindly, or do we bear in mind our contexts and bring those into conversation with antiquity and choose material and themes accordingly? And how do we teach ancient history, literature, and art? Do we make our students aware of the reach of their own gaze and the power in that? What of the readings we prescribe? Do we prescribe secondary material that reflects a diversity of perspectives? Um, and here I'm quite inspired by um, allies Nandini Pandey and others in the US who are bringing anti-racist lenses to the lecture hall and reading material on racecraft alongside classical texts. And I'm inspired by the collected volume that Osama mentioned in our previous panel, um, which brings perspectives from the Arabic speaking world to the fore. And, you know, another question, how do we engage with Euro-American material that we do prescribe to our students? Now, for those of us around the table today, the answers to these questions are probably obvious. I think of how Juliana invites her students to events like this, and you'll forgive my um, pronunciation. Hola, alunos do Brasil. Hello, welcome. Um, and I think of the variety of accounts that shared the ad for this panel on Twitter including allies in Europe and the US. Um, beyond teaching and social impact projects, I've also been wondering how we force others to engage with us. Here I'll touch on two things. Um, first, I've already alluded to this in mentioning Osama's book, is publication and other ways of making public. Now, my colleague, Dr. Samantha Masters, um, is involved in producing the follow up to this book, South Africa, Greece, Rome, Classical Confrontations. Um, and she and she's really doing this book um, in which South Africans or Southern Africans and allies write about decolonizing classics. And I'm totally aware that decolonizing is a problematic word, a bit of a marmalade word even. It's, you know, what do we even mean by it? Um, but they're thinking particularly within Southern Africa. So what brings me to mentioning this is that unlike the first volume, which was published by CUP and is only available in hard copy, the European publisher of volume two has partnered with African Minds Publishing to make the ebook open access. So this has been done particularly with scholars, students and enthusiasts outside of the big centers of knowledge production in mind. So this being done, robust and fearless scholarship that holds up a mirror to the colonial entanglement of a discipline like classics is integral to moving beyond the Euro-American gaze, um, which is what we're talking about today. Now I've mentioned other ways of making public and here I'll mention Everyday Orientalism and its series of talks, to which I'm tempted in this context to say, duh. Um, actually, I will say it, yes, duh, <laughs> of course, Everyday Orientalism. Um, but there are also other media such as Chameleon Classics podcast um, on which Katrin, Rachel, I think Osama ha have all been guests, if I'm not mistaken, and which, Although it assumes listenership in the US and UK, which is actually my only bugbear about the podcast, 
It is intentional about populating its lineup of guests with those who stand outside of the Euro-American perspective. So um, with publications and other public platforms, putting ourselves in the public sphere and exposing both academics and non-academics has the potential of putting pressure on the walls of, and this, yeah, what shall we call them, the, the hallowed walls um, and gates meant to keep our perspectives out just by virtue of growing the consumer base that ends up interacting with our various disciplines. I hope that makes sense. Um, these are just a few thoughts I penned over the past week. And now I am aware of the time and I've probably already gone over, I'm sorry, Rachel. Um, but um, another important aspect of moving beyond the Euro-American gaze is through effective network building. Um, I'm so grateful to Francisca Neto, who's actually here, for putting Katrine in touch with me so that I might be exposed to this network um, from which I've learned a lot and can, I'm sure I'll continue to learn from. And in line with this, um, the African Classicists Network will have its inaugural meeting next month and was born out of some colleagues of mine recognizing a need for our continent to link up scholars and teachers of classics so that we're all more aware of publications and conferences and the like beyond our national borders and to open up the way for sharing of perspectives and resources perhaps somewhat akin to what Liverpool manages to do in the global north. I should probably stop here, um, but know that I'm hopeful that we do have what it takes to move beyond the dictates of certain aged centers of knowledge, production and learning. And this panel, I think, is a testament to that. Thank you very much, Amy. It's wonderful to have you back. And let's welcome a, a new speaker to this, this panel, Aaron D'Souza, who is an archaeologist specialising in Nubian material culture of the second millennium BCE. His re research takes an object-based approach to the complex inter- and intra-cultural contacts that took place across the Greater Nile Valley. He received his PhD in Egyptology from Macquarie University in Sydney in 2017, and at present he is a Lisa Meitner postdoctoral fellow at the Austrian Archaeological Institute in Vienna with his project Living Nubia, funded by the Austrian Science Fund. Before that, he was a Marie Sklogowska Curie Research Fellow, also at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, funded by the European Commission. And he is Nubian ceramics specialist with the Tel Edfu project. He has previously worked on excavations at Hierakompolis, Elephantini, Aswan, Dendera, and Helwan, in addition to grant funded museum based research projects in Sweden, the UK, USA, and Italy. An exciting bit of news, Aaron is also the founding co-editor of the new online journal Interdisciplinary Egyptology, hosted by the University of Vienna, the first issue of which is due very soon. We all look forward to that. Welcome, Aaron. Great. Thank you very much, Rachel, for the intro, and also to, to both you and Catherine for inviting me um, to join the conversation today, which, which I'm very excited about. But I do have to admit, though, that when I received your invitation, I this is a personal thing, genuinely questioned why you wanted me to be involved and what I would have to contribute. Um, because even though I've engaged with discussions about diversity in the ancient world and also in academia, um, it's not something that I've engaged with on any deep academic level. So I didn't think that my own personal experiences would be of any interest or value. And then I realized that actually the fact that someone like me who is a diverse person would even question the value of their experience and contribution is precisely why this conversation needs to happen. So after waiting a couple of days, I did, and thinking about it, I, I accepted the invitation and I'm very happy to be here and to learn from, from everyone on the panel. Um, so what I wanna talk about today is from my own personal experience and from my own perspectives. And so I wanna start with some background about myself and to what makes me a diverse person. So my family comes from Singapore, and we're what's known as Eurasian, meaning that we have Portuguese and Dutch ancestry via India, Malaysia, and then eventually Singapore. So in other words, we're children of the spice trade, I guess, which is a poetic way of saying that we're the product of the European exploitation of Southeast Asia. Um, my parents, my two older sisters, migrated to Australia just about 40 years ago, or actually just over 40 years ago. Um, they became Australian citizens, and I was born not long after that. 
Um, like all immigrant families, my parents worked very hard. They worked very menial jobs to start with to make a, a comfortable life for us or as comfortable as they could. Um, but at the same time, those early years in Australia were sometimes quite unpleasant for them and for my sisters. Um, Australia had only recently abolished the white Australia policy, so there weren't very many Asian families around at that time, especially in the outer suburbs of Sydney where we lived. Um, and I was too young to remember any of this, of course, but I have heard stories of our neighbours referring to my family as the tribe, of my sisters being made to eat their school lunch outside of the classroom because their food smelled funny, or of other kids throwing rocks at them because they were, they were brown and different, and other such stories. But by the time that I got to school, things were a little bit different because immig more immigration meant that there were more foreign people, culture and cuisines becoming more familiar in Australian society, or I should say Sydney society. Um, and at high school, I would say that the ratio of white students to other students was about 50-50. So I didn't really feel that different. My undergraduate degree at university was actually in design. Um, and there I was in a cohort of students from all backgrounds, including friends from India, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Korea, and a bunch of other countries. So again, I never really felt out of place. But then the picture changed when I took up Egyptology at a postgraduate level. And this is something that I only realized looking back. Um, I was only one of perhaps two or three non-Anglo-European people in my cohort. And at that time, it didn't feel like an issue because I guess Australia is so multicultural, so it wasn't really something that crossed my mind. Um, but the fact that Australia is so multicultural makes the whiteness of Egyptology in, in Australia all the more surprising. Then when I began my postdoc career in Europe in 2019, I became acutely aware of my difference. Um, one colleague, when I arrived in Vienna, who had all the best intentions, told me that I was not what they had expected when they heard an Australian guy was coming to the Institute and that I didn't look Australian. Another asked me, inevitably, where are you from? To which I said, Sydney. No, but your family is not Australian, they replied. No, my family is from Singapore. Oh, I see, they said, but you don't look Asian. And then I would have to explain the whole Portuguese and Dutch thing. And I then realized that I was the only not white Egyptologist in Vienna, as far as I can see, at a postdoc level. And at present, there is only one other person who is an Egyptian man studying for his PhD. But it also made me reflect back on Egyptology in Australia, and that even though it was in a more multicultural context, the demographic of Egyptology in Australia was still very much white. So why am I telling you all of this? Firstly, I want to take a second to acknowledge the fact that I feel the need to justify the fact that I am a diverse person. Um, but also, on some level, to note that I myself don't feel particularly diverse, or whether this is an imposter thing, I'm not sure. So yes, I am of Asian descent, and yes, I have brown skin, but I was born, raised, and educated in Australia, and I'm now working in Central Europe, and all of those things make me feel like I'm white in a way. So in all of these discussions about diversity in academia, I often find myself asking, am I really that diverse? Which then leads me to one of the issues that I want to talk about, hopefully, in this discussion, which is what do we mean when we talk about diversity and who decides what is diverse and what isn't. Um, an example of this is that I recently wrote an application for a job in the US and I spoke to people to get advice and I was strongly advised to quote, play the diversity card. Um, not only am I brown, but I also can also play the LGBTQ card. And I'm not gonna lie, I played those cards because I know that it helps, but I hated the fact that this was even an issue and that I had to do this or that I felt that I had to do this and that my body and my identity were like aces in a game of poker. So even though I did it, it made me extremely uncomfortable to do it. And it made me feel that these aspects of my identity were more important than my academic experience and credentials that I'd worked so hard to achieve. This all leads me then to wonder which aspects of diversity are valuable and is being an Australian person, even though I'm of Southeast Asian descent, diverse enough? And why should, I, why should any of this matter in the first place? And who makes these decisions about what is diverse and what isn't, and what are their motivations in doing so. And we can also reflect on the difference between my experience in studying design compared to, to Egyptology, which was noticeably more white. And that ancient history, and in this case, the history of Northeast Africa, is still predominantly viewed through Western eyes. The second issue that I want to discuss relates to Egyptology as an academic discipline, which in my opinion, needs to broaden its horizons if it wants to remain relevant, hence the reason that I started this journal, Interdisciplinary Egyptology. So generally speaking, 
most of the problems that I've had with Egyptology are not anything to do with who I am, the color of my skin or whatever, but with what I study in Egyptology. So I study ancient Nubian culture and archeology. span And because of that, I've frequently been told that I'm not a real Egyptologist and have missed out on or have been excluded from job opportunities because of this. Um, and I've also been described as working on the fringe of Egyptology. But I put it to you that my university degrees say Egyptology, but I've only ever done field work in Egypt that 80% of the sites and material that I study are in Egypt or come from Egypt, that I've written a bunch of articles about archaeological material from Egypt, and I write extensively about Egyptian Nubian relations. So I would like someone to explain to me how I'm not a real Egyptologist or that what I do is fringe Egyptology. And this inevitably leads back to discussions about diversity, but this time in a more ancient context. So by this, I mean that limiting Egyptology to stuff that pharaohs did or stuff that pharaohs wrote not only means that the discipline will run out of stuff to study and eventually consume itself into oblivion, um, but it also overlooks all of this rich complexity and diversity that made ancient Egypt so incredibly fascinating. So as my last point, which ties into what both Juliana and um, Amy have said, is that there's been a lot of discussion in, in other forums about who gets to study the past. But what we also need to think about is what aspects of the, star, of the past are being studied and where do we draw disciplinary boundaries? Why do we draw disciplinary boundaries? Although I would say the drawing these boundaries is the actual problem. And how do changes in what is deemed relevant would encourage more diversity and inclusion? Thanks. Thank you so much, Aaron. Our next speaker is Makola Gomez, another speaker we're welcoming back from our previous panel. She has the, the, the fabulous Twitter handle, Old Things Are Fun, which I appreciate a lot. She's a historian of pre-modern South and Southeast Asia with a focus on early India and the Eastern Indian Ocean world. Her current book, Rule Through Blood, Lineage, Territory and Power in Early India, traces a critical history of the intersections between kinship, caste, land and power in India until 1000 CE. She's also working on a project that explores interactions across the pre-modern Eastern Indian Ocean world through language, ritual and documentary practices. And she's interested more broadly in social and economic history, epigraphy and religion. Welcome back. Thank you, Rachel. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation once again and to add my voice to what already has been wonderful, critical observations and reflections and perhaps most excitingly, you know, future oriented uh, directions. And I hope to add my voice to this. So the last time when we met, I talked about my own scholarly biography and how as a scholar of pre-modern South and Southeast Asia, I see my work in relation to classics. Uh, but today I would like to shift the focus away from uh, myself uh, to talk about scholarship that has actually created conceptual paradigms beyond the Euro-American gaze. Uh, I focus on the work of Professor Romila Thapar, and I recently published an article on the occasion of Professor Thapar's 90th birthday, and I've reflected on some of the questions that I raise here in greater depth in that article. Professor Thapar's scholarship is significant because it shifted the terms of the debate as set out within older scholarship. Colonial and Indian historians in the first half of the 20th century mainly wrote political histories through inscriptional sources. And needless to say, these were foundational uh, perspectives and histories. Um, and in the 1950s and 60s in post-colonial India, um, the scholarship uh, that emerged in this paradigm shifting time, um, Romila Thapar's work can be added to this uh, group or this paradigm shifting uh, history writing. Uh, and scholars like Professor Thapar started to write about past beyond the history of kings and dynasties to focus now on intersections between social, cultural, and economic histories. As a young historian in the new nation state of India, Professor Thapar was and indeed continues to be deeply committed to fostering a secular democratic Indian Republic. 
to this end she has constantly questioned existing conceptual paradigms especially those that look at south asian history through eurocentric lenses what i take away from such work is to not just critique and question eurocentric paradigms but also to always move towards creating new conceptual horizons professor thapar does this for example in an essay titled ideology and the interpretation of early indian history uh, this was originally delivered as a lecture at cornell university in 1974 and later published in the form of an essay in this essay say she pries open how ideology right both colonial and anti colonial nationalisms influenced interpretations of early indian history she points to how colonial ideologies and the interests of colonial administration dovetail with scholarship to produce orientalist and indological approaches to history some colonial scholars who looked towards indian antiquity with sympathy favored the study of so called oriental languages and took up emergent race theories to write about a aryan race that peopled this fantastical utopic peaceful ancient india other colonial historians however were more critical uh, james mills uh, infamous uh, three volume history of british india first published in 1880 judged indian antiquity to be and i'm quoting mill here rude and backward um and this was of course meant to justify why colonial indian society needed to be restructured through colonial dominance what was implicit yet central to such criticisms like that of mills was the idea of oriental despotism these fantasies of luxurious despotic oriental rulers who owned absolute rights in land so south asia was therefore the other of dynamic europe uh, an unchanging place with no sense of history absence of private property isolated and self sufficient village communities from which oriental despots extracted surplus and you can add to this um so in response in the early 20th century indian scholars began to articulate their own interpretations of history while these scholars drew upon colonial frameworks their scholarship was now influenced by anti colonial nationalism so while on the one hand these indian scholars who largely belonged to the so called upper caste and were men rejected oriental despotism as it criticized caste and patriarchy but took up ideas of this utopic indian antiquity and aryan race theory but now reworked them through their various anti colonial ideologies professor thapar's work and indeed work that i take inspiration from uh is moving away from both these approaches uh, so through an engagement with linguistics archaeology and anthropology scholars like romila thapar questioned colonial aryan race theory and oriental despotism So through a close reading of land grant charters professor thapar traced transformations in state structures social hierarchies and in fact noted minute details about various categories of rights in land in my own work i build upon such scholarship rather than getting distracted by racist frameworks i would like to explore how we might understand the past on our own terms and create conceptual paradigms beyond the euro american days i engage with critical understandings of the past that are grounded in the realities of the present and challenge atavistic notions of an imaginary golden age i believe scholarship and uh, and here i'm adding my voice to the voices that have come before me that scholarship that is based on a rigorous analysis of sources uh critical analytical writing and an engagement with a broad public both within the classroom and outside is crucial to refuting lies and uh rejecting myths that have on many occasions um taken the place of truth and history but more importantly working towards engraving new horizons of thought action and possibility so i'll stop here thank you very much mikola 
Our next speaker also has a, a great Twitter handle, Sasanian Shah. Khodadad Reza Khani, who is joining us from, from California today, is a global historian focusing on Central and West Asia in the first millennium CE. He is the author of Reorienting the Sasanians, which came out in 2017, and the forthcoming volumes Creating the Silk Road, Travel, Trade and Mythmaking, and Iran in the Early Medieval Period. He is currently research scholar at the Leiden Institute for Area Studies in the Netherlands and is editor of the blog iranology.com. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. Um, merci, Catherine, uh, for the um, invitation. And I'm very happy to be in uh, presence of such luminaries. Sorry that I have missed the first session because of family issues. <coughs> And I've learned already a lot, and I look forward to learning more from the panel and from the audience. Um, I might be the odd person here because um, my journey through my studies has led me uh, sort of by the side of the field of classics per se. And I think what I have mostly to say is on the issue of defining borders of fields and gatekeeping the fields. Uh, I think some of the things that I have um, particularly saying in a critical manner is something that is quite current in classics, um, is the issue of languages. But I think my um, approaches to them might be uh, from a different point of view. A uh, quick history of it would be that I'm Iranian, but I actually grew up in Europe. Um, I spent much of my childhood in England, in Switzerland, and south of France. Uh, and like Aaron, I think I grew up thinking of myself as white or not even thinking of myself as any particular color. I just was it. Um, and then as I approached my studies, I never thought twice about the uh, relationship between me, myself and what I want to study. And the first course of study that I decided to undertake and I liked was the history of later Roman Empire the rise of uh, Merovingians and then basically going towards north, I was very curious about the Baltic region and its relationship with further south through many, many different um, sort of curiosities that I don't need to um, detail for you. And the first time I ever felt my color was when somebody asked me, why would an Iranian study Scandinavia? And my answer was one of the greatest ironists of the last hundred years has been Arthur Christensen from Copenhagen. Why would the Scandinavian study Iran? And of course, immediately the contrast of, of course, he's a white colonialist person studying your third world country is has a justification. Why would you bother? This became even more present through two more experiences. One was when I was actually doing, um, applying to do a PhD in Indo-European studies, um, and my interests were languages, and I wanted to make certain research that I didn't bother doing again. And I was told that you don't have Greek and Latin, and you should have Greek and Latin first, while I had Avestan and Sanskrit. And for me, it sounded so absurd that I do have two classical languages and what I think, classical languages, but they are not accepted as classical languages in departments of classics. A Western is taught in, well, if, if it is ever taught in some sort of Iranistic, and Sanskrit in departments of Buddhist, Hindu, whatever studies. Second experience was when somebody told me, you should use the languages you have instead of trying to learn European languages and study European culture. You should learn you should use the languages you have, your knowledge of the East, to study what you know best, which is Iran, which is Central and West Asia. Uh, you notice by giving it that title, I'm avoiding nationalizing it, saying that I'm an Iranist. I end up, I ended up through a series of accidents and academic um, sort of pressures, studying essentially the greater Iranian world, although I work in the Arabic and Armenian and Syriac um, zones as well. 
But that for me was always the present thing. And why the classics? Why the classical world? You notice we constantly talk about the classical world. And this is the only um, thing that has two temporal and geographical uh, limits that are mm, really doing a disservice to both uh, words that we are using there. Classics, if we're talking classics, for everybody is different. And everybody has a classics. There are Chinese classics that you study. There are Japanese classics. There are in, well, they hopefully are Indian classics that people study. Mikola, I'm, I'm so sorry that there are not more people doing Indian classics in India. And there are, of course, Iranian classics, which are not considered in any of the departments of classics. And then when we call the classical world, we really are talking about Greece and Rome. We are not even talking about, I don't know, Bulgaria for that, all that matters. Classical world is the most limited world you can find, really. If you look at it at the globe, it's a backwater of an area. And when we are talking about um, this classical world, we are constantly imagine this expansive um, antiquity which causes certain problems, and I shall end there and end and my criticisms there, that the weight of the research done about classics, the fact that most of the European influenced world has these departments of classics where uh, Greece, where Greek and Latin are taught and where this is studied, and now we are in the levels of studying what has been studied before, makes it really seem like, and I'm here well, going back to Eric Wolf's um, book of Europe and the people without history, is that so much history has been discovered through minute studies of fields like classics about Europe, that there is an assumption in the non-European world, not of the Europeans, and that we all know that we are criticizing the lack of Euro-American understanding of the history of the rest of the world. But what really matters to me is that people in those parts of the world, world do not know their own histories. There is an assumption that we didn't have much history in Iran. We didn't have much history in Central Asia. We didn't have much history in, in everywhere else in the world because we just don't know about it. The idea is that what were we doing then? Uh, there was no law. There was no centralized um, um, system. I've had these arguments with Iranians who have argued about the lack of a proper state system in Iran before the um, connection to the Europeans. And I'm like, wow, you do realize that civilization starts in, in and about the area we live, right? Uh, that state systems, that the idea of kingship and everything comes from that part of the world. Of course, they were political ideas. Of course, they were economic ideas. I, of course, these things had a basis. So it, it completely ends up in a um, lack of a sense of history in the non-European parts of the world as well. So when we talk about away from the Euro-American gaze, which is the sort of the subtitle of the uh, panel today, we should really look at it away from the um, European gaze, not in a very appreciative manner, but in an alarming manner as well, that it is, this is something that is missing from the rest of the world because of the weight of fields like classics. So I shall stop there and look forward to questions and answers. Thank you so much, Khudadad. Our final speaker is known to all of us, I think. Sama Ali Gad is tenured lecturer of papyrology and Greco-Roman studies at Ain Shams University in Cairo, uh, as well as um, with me and Katrine, co-founder of Everyday Orientalism. And he is the founder of his own blog, Classics in Arabic, which is a great read. Due to his non-traditional academic background, he has a broad range of interests, including translation studies, second language acquisition, L1 interference, heritage and foreign language teaching, historical languages teaching learning, Greek and Latin, ancient history, papyrology, Greco-Roman heritage in Egypt, classical Arabic translations from Greek into Latin, modern Arabic translations from Greek and Latin, the hist history of classical studies in Egypt, digital classics, Orientalism, classics and nationalism, classics and colonialism, and the idea of cultural studies in general. Welcome, Osama. 
Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm really honored to be among you again, everyone here. I'm in Nicola uh, Hutard and Alan. Um, and I can relate to all what you have done and you have said. Um, and I will just uh, start with uh, the question of how I fit in, you know, uh, or the whiteness that Aaron and Hudad has been talking about, you know, to think of yourself as a white, you know, so this this racial suppression or, or category, you know, uh, even if you are not seen as white, you know, so that's that's something that. Um, really had bothered me, you know, uh, because I, I, I was brought up in Egypt, you know. Uh, I, I can't relate to, to black and white and other things, you know, but, but I was born in a rural village in Egypt, you know, I'm not from an urban city, which uh, has to do with classics and centralization and other things, you know, in, in almost every country now. And um, my family are mostly farmer, peasants, you know, um, dark-skinned Egyptians, you know, and, but, but my mother comes from a family, oh, she and her father are white, you know, so blue-eyed, you know, blonde hair and other things, you know. So um, the, is the issue of race and racism and whiteness and, and to, to, to fit in was there uh, from, from the very beginning to me. And it moved on when I went to study English uh, and classics, because when I studied English, I began to know about the Greek uh, drama, and when I studied classics, I began to realize uh, that there is a problem. Uh, because, again, um, I can't fit in. Um, the first experience that I had in, uh, in the West, in Europe, in Germany, old Europe, uh, is that why, why you are studying Greek and Latin? You should be studying either Arabic, Islamic, or Egyptology, you know, so that maybe relates to what Arms and, and who that said, you know, uh, you don't fit in, you know, you either Egyptology, okay, or uh, Arabic and Islamic, you know, because these, you know, when you come to the West, uh, this is your, Egypt is exporting lab or, or, or maybe you have some expertise, you know, so I began to look around me and and I don't know if this is true or not. I, I did not have any systematic study of it. You know, the jobs in classics, the jobs in Egyptology, jobs in the Islamic and Arabic uh, disciplines, you know. I began to realize that the West treats us, those who come to the West, you know, to do their master or PhDs, you know, as potential uh, workforce in certain direction, you know. So my direction was a wrong one because I was uh, doing my PhD in uh, Greek and Latin. I mean, papyri, you know, something in between again, you know, it's not Egyptology, it's not Greek and Latin philology. And again, it's not Arabic and Islamic. And, <laughs> and again, the question of Aaron is very relevant, you know. Uh, um, um, if, this, if this is not a tradition, if this is a scientific research, uh, why I should fit in uh, my career, what I have done should be the criteria. And that's why I began classics in Arabic and began to resist, you know. Um, the most important thing is that uh, to fit in, you know, um, is that um, we are speaking of scientific discipline and, and that's, actually what I can see until now, um, uh, I, ha I have to be radical, you know, uh, in my talk today, because my epistemic position, you know, uh, was determined from my own nationality, from my own language, from my own religion as a Muslim. Uh, you should not be studying classics, Greek and Latin and other things, you know. So, uh, the other thing that I want to uh, stress here 
is um, the the question of um, interpretation, you know, the of antiquity of writing the past, uh, and I think I have. <laughs> I have talked about it too much. So I will just uh, read for you um, paragraph, two paragraphs actually, from the book that I'm reading now about the Muslim expansion and Byzantine collapse in North Africa by Walter Kaigi. And um, it's very relevant, you know, because he says that uh, it's an imperative. The imperative has been decolonization of North African historiography with respect to late antiquity and Byzantine area, as it has been the process of reinterpretation of other periods of North African history. I may add also uh, the global South history, the historiography, you know, it has to be decolonized. The implication of that colonialist perspective, the gaze, continue down to the present 20, 21st century. It is not something of the past in every field. It of, course, it, it, uh, it, of course, cannot bear the responsibility for everything, but it can't be ignored. Uh, he continues, late antique and Byzantine North Africa is a construction of colonial and orientalist imagination. And to a significant degree, the French army. Much of the archaeology of the Roman and Byzantine Algeria has an undertaking of the uh, has been an undertaking of the French army with conscious goals of relating the Roman and French occupations and military developments. The archaeology of Algeria developed under circumstances different from those in other parts of the Maghreb, the, the you know the, the North African West. It produced valuable evidence, but within an explicit framework of interpretation. Some underlying historical realities exist, but much is a construction, which requires this, this is simply deconstruction and reconstruction. So I think this, because I talked about Egypt, you know, so again, to move to North Africa, it is actually there. We, we, the historiography, we have to, we have to have this. And this relates to the question of fit in. If I felt myself, you know, or I have been told you don't fit in, what about my, my daughters who are brought up in, in Germany, who go and listen to the history lessons now, you know, and they find the, uh, or study or learn about the great civilization of the past, Greece, Rome, or Egypt, or any other antiquity. Um, and again, they, they, they find themselves, they are not fitting again, because they maybe physically, maybe linguistically, maybe from the religion, they don't fit. And I remember a very important um, statistic about the European Union that, uh, the Muslim population in the European Union are uh, much larger than the population, for example, of Greece, but they don't, they are not a nation. But again, if taken together, they are, for example, much larger than uh, the population of Greece. Uh, so the question of fitting in, the, the question of um, deconstructing the modern interpretation in the antiquity studies is very important. And, and I think that's uh, very evident for everyone here. Uh, but unfortunately, despite the, the, the hard work of the last 10 years from everyone here and uh, beyond this panel, the change is minimal, and I have to say. And, and um, uh, in the job market, you know, uh, it is predominantly, you know, the track is determined. So that's one thing. The other thing is that if it is really the change is there, you have to look at Egypt, for example, and listen and listen or read about decolonization in the paper, which I have stressed, I have talked about it before. There is no discourse, decolonization discourse in Egypt. 
in the Arab world, in the Islamic world. Because again, the change in the West is minimum, you know, it's just changing names, you know. Even though the last 10 years have, you know, been marvelous and we have done wonderful work, but again, it's it has not come up to the gatekeeping and the upper level. And with this, I will end my my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Osama, and thank you again to all of our panelists today. Um, let me now open the floor to questions, comments, um, contributions to the discussion from the audience. And uh, panelists are also welcome at this point if they have got uh, things they would like to respond to in what others had to say. Um, I know I, I found lots of things that, that touched a nerve or chimed with me um, in what many of our panelists were saying. If any of you would like to respond to each other, you're now very welcome to do so too. Well, perhaps while folks are collecting their thoughts, I can uh, turn to what we, we had in the introduction to the advertisement for this panel, one of the questions that we said people were, were going to address. And of course, we, we've covered a wonderful range of, of, of topics. Um, one of the questions that we had in that is, is who actually identifies as being part of the we of classics? Who's left out in the process? And then the crucial bit, how can this we be meaningfully expanded to and impacted by colleagues outside of Euro-American academia? Um, I don't want to put the burden of finding a solution on anyone, but would anyone like to share their, their thoughts on that topic? I cannot not say what I'm thinking right now. I'm sorry, I keep always doing this. Uh, I regret afterwards. Go for it. But then, <laughs> thank you. Uh, based on what Ozana was talking about right now, and then I was talking about, everybody was talking about in, in some sense or another, about fitting in. I, well, most of my academic life, I thought I wanted to fit in. When I met Rachel, remember, I was in some sort of quest to try to fit in. That was, if, if but, I recall, that was at the Women's Classical Committee meeting in Cardiff for a few years ago. Yes, Am I right? Yes, yes. Yes. And then afterwards, when I went to Oxford, everything. So I, I've been always trying to fit in. But at these last times I was there, then I realized I was never going to fit in, no matter what I did. If if I open my mouth, right? I, if, I'm, if I'm quiet, then I can pretend I fit in because I maybe feel uh, South European white enough. But if I open my mouth, people know where I am, I'll never fit in. And I've seen this for many other people, people who lived there for ages, people who went there when they were kids, like many of you uh, were talking about. And then uh, lately I've been thinking, do I want to fit in? Is that what I want? This, this is what the, the basis of what I was thinking in the, 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 the first contributions of my, my, my questions in the beginning. Do I want to fit in? What, it, what does it mean to fit in? Do I want that? Or should they try to fit out <laughs> a little bit? Why do I have to be the one who has to fit in uh, and enter into something which first, I'm never going to be able to be in? And second, which is limited. Do I want to be limited? I mean, I, of course, everybody's somehow limited in their own uh, environments and everything, but to, is the goal to be limited for everybody? It's not just me, for everybody. Uh, I, I don't know if there is this, the, the, the fit out thing, but I hope uh, the, 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 the expression, everything. But since I'm, I'm, I'm one of the few here who are not, native speakers of English. That's the one thing too, talking about languages. How do I fit in if I'm not a native speaker of the language of people I want to fit in? Um, how, how am I read in terms of what sort of accent, what sort of uh, English mistakes she makes? Oh, it, it, does she uh, present yourself a fluid, is fluid enough? Do I need to uh, be patient to listen to her while she tries to speak a bad English to me? 
uh, I've seen this so many times, you know, this is uh, an example of that. And, and just just to, to, to sum up, I mean, uh, what, what does it mean to fit in? Well, how and why and do we really need to fit in? Who, what is to fit in for whom? And I guess maybe that's not the point to start with. Um, Amy had her hand up, but before that, I'd just like to um, read out a comment that Abir has made in the chat where he says that he relates to um, what's being said today. One of the things that I really enjoy is to excavate in Scotland. The rain, the midges, why? <laughs> Sorry. Um, being an uh, Egyptian and an Egyptologist who learned archaeology in, in Egypt, a discipline highly influenced by colonialism. I, I later studied Scottish archaeology and have been digging here for over 15 years. What I most enjoy is public engagement when the public come to events to find an Egyptian woman telling them about the local history. And Abir, I apologize for misgendering you at the, at the beginning of, of what I said there. Um, but Amy, you had your hand up. Would you like to speak? I really just wanted to dovetail on off of what Juliana was saying about fitting out, um, if we can call it that, which I'm going to call it from now on. Um, I think if enough of us fit out <laughs> um, or stand beyond the, the gates of fitting in, um, there is pressure to broaden the horizons of the classical world. I really appreciated what was said about um, the limited nature of the way we use those words. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think of concrete examples, a university here in South Africa tried to add Sanskrit to its classics department. Um, in the department I work in now, we have um, someone who works on ancient West Asia and North Africa, and we're all sort of in the same mess. Um, it, it just, I think the more this happens, the easier it'll become to start shifting the meaning of classics, to start shifting um, the walls, um, just moving them by force. I, I'm quite open to that, really. Aaron? Yeah, um, so I also want to comment on this, this fitting in thing. Um, from an Egyptological perspective. And this is something I will say, I've not been, I've not said in a public forum before because I've been too scared. And this is precisely going back to the fitting in thing. The reason I haven't said this is because I'm conscious that I need to get a job or that I want to get a job. But if I say things, then I won't get a job. Um, but my problem with Egyptology is, is that I keep getting told that I'm not a real Egyptologist, as I said. Um, and that every time you see an Egyptology job, it says that you have to have the ability to teach language. I had to study Middle Egyptian. I could teach Middle Egyptian. But because people see on my CV that I've written about Nubia, I'm not an Egyptologist anymore. Um, and so I've been beating myself over the head trying to remodel myself or reframe myself or repackage myself as an Egyptologist who is more balanced and who can teach the history of Pharaonic Egypt and the archaeology of Pharaonic Egypt but then I get irritated because I shouldn't have to do that. Um, and that it shouldn't be me that has to change myself. It has to be the discipline that has to fix itself. And so, you know, I've, I've been, it was, a, it was a job application process that was a very transparent one where we got reports on, everybody saw everybody's reports on everyone that applied for this job. And my report was, oh yeah, he's got a good CV, but he does Nubia. And that meant I was, I was out. Um, which then kind of triggered the, you know, starting this interdisciplinary Egyptology thing, which was the whole point of it is to try and make Egyptology bigger. Um, but, but, but this idea of, to put that aside, the idea of fitting in is like, why, why am I bending over backwards? Or why, why are individuals bending over backwards to change themselves when we shouldn't have to? Um, you know, because I, I am an Egyptologist, I was trained as an Egyptologist, it's just that I happen to branch off and now study Nubia. Um, but I have the foundation, but yeah. Anyway, but before I continue- yeah, that, I, I've, I've got to say, Aaron, that really strikes a chord. My, my first degree was in Egyptology, but there is no way I could convincingly pass as an Egyptologist. And I the reason I have a job in a classics department now is because I managed to convincingly pass as a cis classicist for long enough for them to hire me and for me then go back to doing weird stuff 
Um, but it's it is it is like you know I'm not I'm not using the passing metaphor innocently either. I think that there's something in particular here that we we just need to we spend so much time pretending to be something or convincing yep. people that we have the credentials to be something. Um, but uh, Khurdajaj has got his his hand up as well. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to comment about the entire thing and think about it from a different way. One of my problems is fit in into what field. Uh, one of my issues has always been that I'm on the fringes of many. Um, um, anything that has to do with late antique, early medieval Europe, obviously, is where I studied. But I am supposed to fit within Iranian studies, which is largely a colonial creation by French, German, and English uh, Orientalists of the 19th century, which is organized around the learning of languages, uh, an em emphasis on Zoroastrianism, and an emphasis on uh, texts. And at the same time, Islamic studies, because I do early medieval, but obviously I do it early medieval Middle East, which is not quite medieval, as again, another experience during PhD made it very clear. I'm not quite a medievalist either. And for me, it comes out all very natural uh, that I, I study what I like um, to commiserate with Abir. Uh, Abir, I actually did some excavation in Iceland, and that's one of the things I don't put on my CV because it actually confuses people. Um, I, I, there, there are two major things I leave out of my um, CV is one of them having worked on uh, Icelandic archaeology, and the second one is actually having written the, um, articles for um, Encyclopedia of Ancient History, one of them on Prussians, the pre-Germanic Prussians. And a couple of times um, in interviews, people told, told me that I misspelled Persians. Uh, if I wrote an article about Persian, why am I misspelling them? And I know Prussians, you know, the guys in the Baltics, that's what I wrote about. Why again would you write about Prussians? So for me, the issue is about why even try to fit in when there is no field for me to fit in. I am in and out of about a handful of them. Uh, so my, my, my thing would be, yes, at points, I do work on Greek texts. And then, yes, I would be within the European classics tradition. But I don't wish to. And I never was ever welcomed into it. So no, I don't. We have a couple more comments and um, responses from people in the chat. Would any of these people like to raise their hand or turn their microphone on and speak themselves? Um, if so, please signal that. Otherwise, I will read out or, or summarize comments. I can I can say something briefly. Oh, but uh, Elizabeth has a has her hand up. So, hi Beth. Hi. How's everyone? You guys are probably not seeing me too much here, but great to see you, Catherine. Um, I'd like to bring together two things. I wanted to comment um, on what Amy said about forcing the the boundary change. Right. That's it. That's a great way to put it, that that's what we need to do, right? And you're just the person to say that because we can do this through teaching, right? What we show our students, what we say to our students is classics, they believe us, right? And then we can go forward with that and just keep, and this is exactly something I'm doing next year um, with a class that has a very traditional uh, title because, you know, the university wants this, but then when they get in there, they're going to find something very different from what <laughs> they think they're getting themselves into. And it's about changing that canon, right? It's about saying, no, no, no. I, I just taught a, a whole class on Pompeii. I didn't talk one single time about painting, wall painting. And they all, half of them kind of went, why haven't we done this? We're not doing it. We're going to talk about the Pompeii and Lakshmi statue instead for a while, you know? Um, so I think that teaching is a great way, Amy, for, and I loved how you put that, that we just have to forcefully push those boundaries. Um, and I wanted to bring that in with um, what, Katherine said in the in the in the chat, which exactly as as you know tenured or, or permanent or at least we think we have a secure job, hopefully, you know, um, that we can that we should do that. It is our duty, isn't it, to be the ones to say let's to you know let's forcefully do this and change these boundaries. And I think that this this idea of of not belonging, I think there are a lot more people that that feel this way than we would ever think. And I am, I'm in, in Canada now, I'm an American classicist 
who decided that the Roman provinces was the way forward about 20 years ago. And everyone told me, don't do the Roman provinces. You won't get into a PhD. You won't get a job. You won't do this. You won't do that. But you just have to force it. And as I think Rachel said, you pretend for a minute or two when they, until they give you a job and then you start doing the other things and, you know, you move forward. But now, Katrine, would you agree that so many jobs in North America in Roman archaeology now go to provincial, you know, people who are not doing the mainstream anymore? The mainstream is still getting jobs, too, but I think this has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And that's just sort of my anecdotal view of the things. But I wanted to thank everyone for these great things that I've heard. Uh, and Usama, thank you for your email yesterday. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I know, no problem, yeah. Um, we also have a comment from Morag Carcel in the chat. Um, who is picking up on some of what Aaron was saying and saying that there are so many parallels with heritage and archaeology and anthropology. Um, we don't really do archaeology and don't fit traditional models. And she also likes Juliana's fitting art, which she's going to adopt as well. Um, we also have um, Catherine making a point about um, Macola's use of the term critical pre-modern history. Uh, as being something that we could potentially get behind as, as a way of um, describing what we do without getting all weird and, and, and disciplinary about it. Nicola, is that, is that the right, is, is the right expression? I'm, I, I'm not even sure I invented it. I think I may have picked it up from somebody else. So <laughs> I, I know, <laughs> no, from the first time. But um, uh, I, I really liked how there were so many sort of themes that were common to all of us. I mean, the theme of you know, roadblocks that we encounter when we try to fit out both institutional and at the level of jobs or even institutional roadblocks when you want to teach something that is not traditionally taught or the way in which it's traditionally taught. Um, and then, you know, of course, the idea of uh, what Osama said, right, deconstruction, but then also reconstruction. So on the one hand, sort of looking at the idea of this Euro-American gaze as a dangerous thing, like what Adad was saying, but at the same time then looking towards the future to see how we can then forge something independent of that. So rather than always, you know, feeling that we must operate or play the game as we've been told, we should just create a new game, <laughs> you know, like just refuse to play the game. But this is of course much harder done than said uh, because of all the things that we have been talking about. So. I have a question for the panelists, which may cause people to groan and, and roll their eyes, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot. How do we reconcile the kinds of things we're trying to do with disciplinary and personal boundaries um, and being in a position of giving advice to students, especially students who are looking for a career in ancient world studies or something? Has, has anyone been in that situation, would like to reflect on it or have any ideas about how we reconcile this? I have been warning students basically anybody has been coming to me I've been warning them against that I was very much encouraged to be interdisciplinary to be to explore all my interests and then um, without going through a personal biography I have had my PhD 10 years ago and I still do not have a, a tenure track job uh, and I've been rejected from tenure track jobs for basically aging out so I on, honestly often tell my students, um, pick a field, fit within it, and then when you get a job, do what you actually want to do. Uh, so I have been, I've been giving advice against what I have actually enjoyed doing it. And uh, I feel rotten about it because I always say, if I, if I wanted to have a career, I would have been a lawyer. I'm pretty good in talking and uh, I'm reasoning. So I could have been a pretty good lawyer. I'm doing history because I wanted to be a historian since I was 12. And it feels sort of um, bad that I'm telling others not to explore their own interests because of the facts that even my contemporaries who were in graduate school with me and are now in positions of permanence as 
to refer to what Catherine was saying, uh, are not trying to in any way to expand the field, but they're actually barricading themselves in. There are economic reasons for it, obviously, since 2009, uh, but that is just a fact. And it's becoming, uh, with the rise of, I guess, rightist um, politics in the world, it's becoming even more and more a fact. So I advise against it generally. I would I would say that um, you know I have tweeted about it in Twitter you know and uh, I think I think every student should think carefully before entering classics or Egyptology or any of these fields you know and he has to have a plan B. Uh, the British Academy reports say that uh, humanist uh, humanitarian humanistic graduates are much more to adapt to upheaval in the economic much more than the STEMs graduates. But I, I don't think that, you know, we, we tend to shift from place to place, which is not, again, an option for STEM graduates. But again, you have to have a plan A, a plan B in teaching, for example, high school teaching or any other things. Or I, I don't know, you have to have something in your uh, bachelor or master degree in order if you were not able to have a job in classics or Egyptology, you could uh, uh, afford a life depending on another job and, and get out of this field until it is fixed. <laughs> That's very hopeful for the future, Osama. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. I, I tend to, I give um, prospective graduate students the same talk my supervisor gave me, which is to say, it doesn't matter how good at this you are at this, you're not going to get a job, you're not going to make money doing this, it may not make you happy. Um, if you can go and be happy doing something else, you go and do that. If you are determined to stick with this, then you have a backup plan. Um, and I, I think um, what Khudadad was saying about advising students to, you know, don't do what I do, I do that as well. I say the fact that I have a permanent position is a fluke of immense luck. And I was hired for a Latin literature job, which I managed to persuade people I was capable of doing. But you're not, you know, Central Asian studies or Egyptology is, is not highly employable. Um, Aaron, you put your hand up. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so... I haven't had a lot of students. I'm supervising a couple of students at the moment. Um, what everyone has just said kind of, to be honest, is vaguely depressing. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, don't, don't try and make a difference until you can. Um, the one thing that sort of stuck with me, and it's kind of what Juliana also said at the beginning of, of when she gave her introduction, is this question that was also put to me by a woman named Mena Aga, who's actually a Nubian Egyptian architect. Um, and I was talking to her about Nubia and stuff like that. And she has a lot of feelings about the way that archaeology is conducted in Egypt. Um, and she put three questions to me and said, you know, if, if, if there's nothing you take away from this conversation, just take away this, these three questions. Um, and those are, why, why do you do what you do? Who are you doing it for? And, oh, God, I forgot the third one. Anyway, but those, those were the two main ones. The third one will come back to me. I had it in my head as I was talking and it's gone. Um, yeah, anyway, but, the, but those are the two main ones. So, because Juliana, I remember at the beginning, you asked, you know, why do we do what we do? In um, the end, it was, it, it was, it's about, it was about, uh, uh, can you, can you talk about contemporary politics? Can, can you change things yes. in the environment? Can the students, do they expect that? Or do you have any pro institutional problems? If you want to do that or any other sort of problems yeah. if you want to do that and this is this is kind of what i also spoke to the students about is like if, if your motivation is to get a job then maybe you need to do certain things if your motivation is to do this differently and to show other people that it can be done differently and you don't expect to get a job then go ahead and do that go and shake the tree rocks the boat um but as long as they've got that motivation, foundational motivation clear in their minds, it's, 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 it's you know, that's, that I think is the key thing. And for me, like I, I started out wanting to get a job um, and I, as time goes on and I'm realizing that that's probably less and less likely, um, I've started shaking the tree a bit more because I feel, I've, I'm feeling like my time is running out. Um, there is a literal war 400 kilometers to the east of where I'm sitting right now um, life is too short. Um, so if, if I 
can change something and if I can do something that will make things different slash easier for the people that come after me and I have to give up and move back to Australia and buy a dog and a beehive or whatever, fine, I've, I've done something. Um, but it, but, but that, that's my personal thing. So the one thing that I'm trying to communicate to students now is be clear about why you're doing this and what you want to get out of it. And who are you doing it for is the other one. Um, so yeah, so I think it comes from motivation. And I, I, I guess it's sort of maybe, I hope is a slightly more positive spin than, you know, don't make, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Um, but just ask yourself why you are doing it. Juliana has her hand up. And that's why I was thinking in the beginning, I don't know, should I put my hand down? This, yeah, okay. And that's why I was thinking in the beginning of also thinking about the undergraduates who are not going to pursue academic careers, the ones who are going to teach children, teenagers, mostly them, or uh, the other, the other things. Uh, in, in terms of here in Brazil, in terms of history, so history for uh, school. Uh, because this is the like 98% of my students, they're going to be doing something else than going to academia. 98% of my students need to process and do what they can or they want to do with what I give them and hopefully change things from the way they are now, uh, here in particular but also change things in terms of thoughts. This is what history is all about. That's why I'm not teaching them the same thing somebody would teach them 100 years ago. So I'll, even because of that, because they're going to be different teachers than I am to them right now. So uh, in terms of the, the, the purpose of what I've been doing, this is one of the, um, the biggest focuses of what I've been doing. Actually, I'm doing this to my students so as well. Some of them are here in the session. They know very well I'm so what I'm talking about. I give them the freedom that most people don't. It's not easy, but this is something I really feel I need to do because if I, I'm, I'm, I won't be able to, to, to tell them that we're going to give them a job or not. So it's not up to me, unfortunately, to say, well, if you do this, you're going to get a job or you're not. Some of them do. Some of them don't for any other reasons that are not related to academia, for personal reasons, whatever. I'm not uh, in charge of that. But what I am in charge of is to help them think of, of doing something different and of having a different voice. And, I, and that's something else I keep telling them. Of course, you, you can disagree with me as long as you know what you're talking about. And this is a huge thing right now because sometimes I have those students who enter the class and they think they, they already know everything and they are that either to confirm what they uh, or thought they knew or to confront me because I'm saying something different. Okay, confront me, but if you do really know what you're talking about, which is mostly not the case, they heard something about somebody, that sort of thing. So this is, uh, in the end, this is like I said, what I said, it's 98% of my students, so it's 98% of my job in terms of what I do every day. Uh, it means also that I'm writing less than I should, of course, I just realized what I said, but <laughs> in terms of, well, different legacies, of course, what sort of legacies we, uh, we end up providing the students with. So that's that's it. Michaela. Yeah, I just wanted to add my voice to this conversation about um, classics and the field of ancient history where I see myself and th the question of its broader public. So both in the classroom and this question of public facing scholarship. I mean, for me, I see the importance of my work and my scholarship in directly countering the way in which the pre-modern past is being manipulated in present day South Asia to push forward various kinds of exclusionary nationalistic claims. And it's vital that those of us who are invested in the kinds of transformative critical scholarship that we all are 
in in some ways working towards that you know this is a conversation that i would like to be having more with other scholars of the pre modern world may i add one more thing here one of the things that we also have to conquer and i think gets over is the dominance of the modern language barriers that have been created for the study of the classics um, it essentially seems to be a majority english french german field and in order to know it you know need to know these things again going back to my iranian experience uh, one of the problems that i've that i've always faced is despite the fact that majority of the sources for example for the achaemenid period in iran are written in ancient greek there are no direct translations of um, any of these texts from greek to persian rather via english german and french and whenever i bring up this issue it becomes a matter of well how do we learn greek at all because there are no books written for a persian speaker there are no, none of these studies are available you first need to know english you first need to know french to be able to study it so i think one of the things that we could encourage is production of teaching material so going back to what amy was pointing out um, that teaching is the foundational thing here and something like that that we make the study of these things more accessible by um really i don't know how we could do this but removing this modern language barrier as well i also can add to that and say that there's one thing that is i think a problem with egyptology and it's something that i suffered from is that we're required to learn German and French, but not Arabic. That, that when people go to do field work in Egypt, they can't communicate with anybody. And you know, it's happened to me, like my, my Egyptian Arabic is minimal um, and I'm trying to learn more, but I'm also trying to learn German at the same time. And this is becoming a bit of a brain fog because I live in a German speaking country. Um, but yeah, but, but why are we studying Egypt and not learning the language of the country that we're meant to be studying? Um, this is something that I find really surprising and it's shocking also. Um, and like with this journal that we started for um, interdisciplinary Egyptology, one of the things I pushed for was to have, at a minimum, Arabic translations of all our abstracts. We, we, we don't have the resources to do full translations, but at least something that makes it more accessible. Um, and I know it's only a small thing, but it was something. It was, it was what we could do with the resources that we have. But, but yeah, it's just a, a really shocking thing about Egyptology that this is not required yeah it's, have it's the assignment oh sorry sorry rachel I sorry, just I gonna... to say... <laughs> go ahead uh, i was going to say we have that we have the same issue in in classics as as well with 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 lack of of respect for different languages uh, anybody who was at the um international association of papyrologists meeting a few years ago will remember the attempt that was made to suggest that arabic might be one of the official languages of the association which has been running for almost 100 years and that sank without a trace but sorry katrine i was speaking over you i was gonna say the same thing and also that classics has the same issue with uh modern greek and turkish this is not required and for instance in this department i'm in the department of classics now at the university of toronto it's been very recently accepted for students doing, for instance, Greek archaeology, that instead of having German, Italian, or French as one of their two foreign language exams at the PhD level, they can take modern Greek. But it's not embedded in the program, right? So the supervisor had to, to make a, a plea for it. There's also an issue with, with languages outside the North American system where there's more examination and, and class time built into the PhD structure that in, in Europe and a lot of places, certainly in the UK, you're expected to magically acquire a reading knowledge of French and German at a minimum, but you're given no time, support or funding to do that. It's just a thing that magically happens. And that, of course, is a, um, a, a structural issue to do with privilege as well. Because if you're the kind of person who, you know, went to the kind of school that drilled you in these languages at a young age, or you have the time and money to go and study abroad and so forth, that's going to be easier for you. But for a lot of people, that's a, it's a major hurdle and it's discriminatory. 
I have to apologize to everybody. I have to get to the airport. Um, it was a privilege and pleasure to be in your presence. I hope these things continue and uh, I look forward to seeing and hearing everybody. See you on Twitter. Bon voyage and thank you so much for being part of this discussion. We look forward to many more in the future. And perhaps seeing as we are, we have been here for over an hour and a half, perhaps we might want to think about um, questions to, to, to think about summing up comments people would like to make in, in conclusion, and then we can let our speakers have a very well-deserved rest because they have been on the spot for a long time. I do have something to say about the fit in, fit out before, before people like it. Because <laughs> I think the problem, the, the problematic word here is to fit. It's not the, the in or out. Because fitting out is, it will also become a problem. Because fitting is a problem, which means you have to establish boundaries and definitions of what is. Uh, uh, what you can consider or what is uh, correct or was acceptable or not. So maybe stay with the in or out, but get, remove the fit part of it because this isn't yet this is what we're talking about. It's the fitting is a problem in itself. So that. Would anyone else like to? Oh, yes, Suleiman, your hand. Yeah, I think this is the second or third um, program that I joined with, uh, you know, everyday Orientalism. And every time I feel this uh, tension between a lot of um, depression and hope, and I, I just wanted to bring that up because on the one hand, uh, I think we all agree that in terms of the job market and disciplinary boundaries, uh, we're telling our students, you know, consider a lot before getting into this. And then I'm, my nightmare would be people, uh, like the people in, in this kind of uh, meeting uh, would leave out, would go out, and then people don't care about such issues would be, you know, studying these things and then having PhDs and having jobs. To me, it's even a, even a worse prospect. So I'm kind of feeling that the hope that comes out of this should be a bit more uh, emphasized and focused. Otherwise, I mean, we really, we cannot live with this situation of a complete depression in our field. So I just wanted to thank people in the panels giving me that hope, you know, that still there are people that care about such issues. Otherwise, it would become a terrible place to live or inhabit within academia. And I'm, I'm wondering if other people have the same tension in, in, in the kind of Islamic mystical tradition. There's this idea that you should always be hopeful and fearful at the same same time in terms of your salvation and that's how i'm feeling about academia these days especially getting to these kind of meetings so uh thank you very much for giving me that roller coaster feeling so thank you uh Macaulay, your hands up yeah i mean i just wanted to say something about this tension between depression and hope and you know, what Lauren Berlant called cruel optimism. But the idea that, you know, one of the things that gives me hope is precisely finding kindred spirits and the sense of kinship and a sense of community. And I do think that as long as we feel that we're alone and we're isolated and we're doing this all on our own on some fringe, it's very, very depressing. But when I find myself with people who feel similarly, then I feel that we can, you know, in solidarity, in critical solidarity, of course, uh, and in acknowledging our differences, but at the same time, you know, getting together to build something and getting organized that I find the sort of brightest future of future oriented hope. Aaron. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I, I am a little, I, I have moments where I feel sort of anti Egyptology and I feel sad about the whole thing and I lie awake at night stressing out about the fact that I'm probably going to have to leave the field not by choice but because it's just the way that things go um but I'm also and, and Osama will will know about this because he was involved in one of these panels that we hosted for interdisciplinary Egyptology and I know I keep going on about that but it's, it's a thing that we're trying to do to change things um 
but it, that experience made me hopeful because we hosted this series of panel discussions. There were 15 of them where we had, no, 12 of them, where we had um, four or five speakers talking about how they want to see change in Egyptology. We had hundreds of people, like at every session, there was at least 250 to 300 people at all of the sessions. Um, it was getting retweeted all over the place. I think in total, we had something like nearly 800 individual people from 39 countries. Um, it was, we were completely, it, it blew our minds. Like we were not expecting this at all, but it, but it filled us with hope. And the other thing that filled us with hope is that these people that were tuning in were young people, they were students, they were the people that we wanted to be reaching. Um, they were the people who's, who are ready to see a different way, the people who are ready to do things a different way, who want to learn a different way. Um, so that did fill us with a bit of optimism. Um, so I hope that, you know, I, we do, well, at least me, I do what I can in the time that I am allowed. Um, but even if I do have to leave, I know that there are people who will come after me that will do the same. I sound like I'm going to die. Like, it's, this is really silly. But, but, but yeah, if, if, even, though if I, even if I do have to leave the field, I'm confident that there will be people to continue trying to change things. Um, it may take a number of generations, but, you know, I, I think it will happen just slowly. Juliana. Uh, uh, okay, then. Um, I'm actually quite hopeful. Uh, 20 years ago, this conversation would have been totally impossible, totally impossible. Uh, nobody would listen to what I had to say. And I already had to say the same kind of same things I've been saying right now. But people who just wouldn't care, I knew that. I was just trying to fit in and finding a wall in front of me all the time. Um, some people are listening and it takes time. Of course, there are those in the old ones in the ivory tower and don't say the old ones in terms of age, but in terms of frame of mind, they're, they're gonna be there in, in the ivory tower and they, they, they'll be gone in some time for now. This is, takes longer than we thought we, we, we wanted, I'm, I'm sure, but it takes longer, but it's happening. So uh, we are finding our place slowly, not that slowly, I'm not, right, not that slowly anymore. I'm really hopeful about that. So I hope, I, I hope more people watch this, the, the recording of this session uh, that, that's the thing, we put it online and I have no idea who is going to watch it later on and some of them get in touch, and most of them don't, but I hope this works for everybody who uh, is willing to, to hear from us, hear from everybody who wants to say these things, and it's, it's changing, it's really changing. I remember when I was a graduate student trying to fit in, and the, I, I hate to say this global north, every, every time I went to, well, I went to Toronto once. Uh, to try to fit in. And I remember I was just about somebody that, who that people just didn't care about, not just because I was a graduate student, but or some sort of oddity. And of course, I mean, in a, a, a privileged situation here in Brazil, being tenured, which gives me freedom to, to say these things. But still, I could be, 20 years ago, I could be tenured and nobody would uh, look at me at all because I was some sort of oddity from Brazil, and and this is changing. Just just to to to, to sum up, I mean, uh, it's not as bad as we, uh, in 2022. Everybody has a reason to be depressed about something, right? <laughs> so I, I see the faces. <laughs> so apart from that, this in particular is really good. The fact that I'm talking to you on Zoom, and this is free because I would never have any means right now to travel there. It's really expensive from here. And I have no funding. I have absolutely nothing at all. But I'm here with you talking to you and this is going to be recorded. And this is really not bad at all. So I, I guess this is kind of sums up what I wanted to say. So I'm already thanking you big time, everybody. So for listening to me and for uh, in particular right now, but uh, to join the conversation. And, and this is really fruitful. This is really good. That's it. 
Well, uh, thank you, first of all, to Suleiman for prompting us to uh, end on a more hopeful note. Um, and thank you so much to all of the panellists who've shared their, their views and experiences with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that I've learned a lot and it's given me a lot to think about, um, think about positive action that can be taken in the future as well. This recording is going to be made available online through the Everyday Orientalism YouTube channel and also through our blog post work, which we will be updating with information um, about books, articles, resources and so forth, which have been uh, mentioned in the discussion today. So thank you for joining us on behalf of me, Katrina Nasama, and goodbye. <laughs>